the question which will require a couple of centuries even to be completely heard in all its profundity. Nietzsche saw himself as a philosopher of change. Not only did he live and write during a time of great technological and scientific advancement, politically and socially times were turbulent. But philosophically and culturally, the greatest of changes was to occur. In 1882, Nietzsche had prophesied the death of God. And although it had already been done, God is dead and we have killed him, the news is still traveling. This prodigious event is still on its way, still wandering. It has not yet reached the ears of men. Just like how we see lightning before we hear thunder, the news of the death of God will not reach our ears for quite some time. The message needs time to sink in. And not just the message itself, but the implications of the message. Far-reaching consequences that will take their time to become manifest in ways that we cannot and will not anticipate. God is dead, but given the way of men, there may still be caves for thousands of years in which his shadow will be shown. God may be dead, but we still live in his shadow, and we will continue to live in his shadow for quite some time. That was Nietzsche's prediction. Now, if you're familiar with Nietzsche, you know that this death of God is not simply a theological statement. The death of God is a symbolic expression. The death of God is actually the death of meaning. Let's be more precise. For 2000 years, European culture had been dominated by the idea of God. God was the source of truth, beauty, and justice. What is good? Good is whatever is sanctioned by God. What is evil? Evil is whatever is prohibited by God. The moral order had God as its foundation. Critically, the concept of God is transcendent. He exists not as a part of the world, but rather God exists outside of the world, if you will, above it, beyond it. That is what allows God's morality to be objective. It's sacred. It doesn't find its origin in our world, with all its imperfections and contingencies. So what is really at stake with the death of God is not the disappearance of God himself, but rather the death of objective morality as such. Scientific atheism had been preparing itself in the decades leading up to Nietzsche's proclamation. Little by little, God had become superfluous. The world could be explained through the scientific method. Even worse, the place of man in the universe had been under constant attack. No longer were we created in God's image, chosen by God to fulfill his divine plan. Copernicus robbed us of our central place in the universe, and Darwin gave us a worldly explanation for the origin of man descent from an ape-like ancestor. But what these scientific discoveries reinforced is the idea that only this world is the real world. Confidence in the scientific method and its great explanatory power eroded the necessity for a beyond world. After all, we seem to be doing pretty well without it. Yet our existence in the material world is characterized by change and contingency. Everything is in constant flux. Cultures change, wars are fought, empires are lost and won. There is continental drift, entropy, the universe expands. Where can we find something everlasting, something eternally true, a solid foundation on which to build our table of values? Where can meaning be found? Certainly not in this world. Well, what of another world? Ah, but it seems that we have declared such a world to be redundant. Along with getting rid of God, we have gotten rid of the possibility of meaning as such. We have lost our footing. And instead of being special creatures, put here on this earth, in the center of the universe, in a great design by a passionate creator, we are simply evolved monkeys on a rock floating through space. This is our new place in the world and the universe. The new way in which we look at ourselves. What kind of values will this create? Above all, what does this say about existence? Our existence used to mean something. We had our part to play in the grand, ordered, metaphysical structure that God provided for us. But the question that concerns us here, a question that Nietzsche viewed as the most difficult question to answer, whose implications will not be completely clear for centuries to come, concerns the significance of existence. And it was Arthur Schopenhauer who was the first to completely and honestly put forth this question. When we thus reject the Christian interpretation and condemn its significance as a forgery, we are immediately confronted in a striking manner with the Schopenhauerian question. Has existence then a significance at all? And while all credit is due to Schopenhauer for posing the question, his answer wasn't satisfactory to Nietzsche. But how could the answer be good? 
The question is so deep that it will require a couple of centuries even to be completely heard in all its profundity. Schopenhauer fell into the same trap as other philosophers in the post-death of God age. A mistake has been made by all philosophers except for Nietzsche himself, according to Nietzsche. The mistake is the following. You get rid of God, but cling to his morality all the more. This dissonance, this strange habit of philosophers, shows just how strong the shadow of God remains, how the after-effects of Christianity still linger on. Schopenhauer raised the question. He seemed ready to move beyond Christianity, as he was, in Nietzsche's words, Germany's first truly atheistic philosopher. Yet in his answer to that profound question on the significance of existence, he suddenly makes a U-turn and goes back to Christianity. Schopenhauer's own answer to this question was, if I may be forgiven for saying so, a premature, juvenile reply, a mere compromise, a stoppage and sticking in the very same Christian ascetic moral perspectives, the belief in which had got noticed to quit, along with the belief in God. Nietzsche definitely has a point here. When we read Schopenhauer's philosophy and get to the fourth book of his main work, The World as Will and Representation, we learn about Schopenhauer's ethics. We should love our neighbor, show compassion, lose our egoism to the point of losing our ego entirely. Truly virtuous individuals might even become ascetics and deny the will, as Schopenhauer calls it, by renouncing earthly possessions and temper our desires by fasting, praying or meditating and practicing abstinence. Doesn't that sound suspiciously like the life of a Christian monk? And isn't love thy neighbor the first commandment in Christianity? That was Nietzsche's point. How coincidental, how convenient, he says with sarcasm, that even though you don't believe in God, still all his rules and ethics and morals seem to be true anyway. They are rid of the Christian God and therefore think it all the more incumbent upon them to hold tight to Christian morality. The flaw in this reasoning is obvious. Without God, there is no reason to listen to God's rules or view them as anything other than a possible set of rules among possible sets of rules. Without the transcendent God, the source of objective morality, to give solid foundation to this Christian morality, the Christian framework loses its power. Christianity is a system, a complete outlook upon the world, conceived as a whole. If its leading concept, the belief in God, is wrenched from it, the whole is destroyed. Nothing vital remains in our grasp. This might sound logical when it's spelled out like this, but persistently there has been a delay in the victory of atheism on the one hand and full acceptance of the implications of this on the other. Here on the channel we've done a video on Nietzsche's warning to scientists which dives deeper into this topic as it relates to modern science. Nietzsche argues that these modern scientists may not believe in God, yet, just like Schopenhauer, they cling to his morality all the same. Check it out if you're interested. Going by reactions from viewers, it's one of the best videos on the channel. This delay we've mentioned, this dissonance between knowing God is dead and truly acting like it, is precisely what Nietzsche alluded to when he said it will take some centuries for the Schopenhauerian question to truly reach our ears. It turns out we find it very hard to let go of the Christian framework, and Nietzsche chastises his fellow German philosophers for delaying even the question, for delaying even Schopenhauer. It has to be ascribed precisely to the Germans, those with whom Schopenhauer was contemporary, that they delayed this victory of atheism longest and endangered it most. Nietzsche is mainly referring to Hegel here. Hegel's philosophy is centered on the concept of the Geist, or the spirit, as the principle of organization and development of nature, or rather reality itself. Hegel is notoriously complex and the details need not concern us here. What is important to Nietzsche is that Hegel, with his philosophy of the Geist, injected a measure of divinity into reality. In the Hegelian worldview, the world is in a continuous process of improvement as the Geist develops itself and attains higher degrees of absolutization. Again, the specifics don't matter as much as the general idea. Hegel proposed that in reality, in nature, a certain divinity is at play. There is a guiding process that guides nature, yet is not part of nature itself, strictly speaking. It's a spark of divinity, something beyond ourselves. In other words, something to give meaning to reality. All of history, according to Hegel, is underpinned by a rational process. The Geist develops itself towards an end goal. There is a finish line, a point at which history literally completes itself. Every step along the way is thus imbued with meaning, in that it brings us closer to the end. By doing this, Nietzsche argues, Hegel postponed the asking of the question 
has existence significance at all. In a strange intermediate position, beyond Christian metaphysics but before true atheism in the brand of Schopenhauer, Hegel thus represents the final big movement in philosophy to save the idea that existence is significant, worthwhile. We all partake in history and thus in the grand historical process guiding our world. We all have a role to play, big or small. What matters is that we matter. Hegel especially was its blocker par excellence, in virtue of the grandiose attempt which he made to persuade us at the very last of the divinity of existence with the help of our sixth sense, the historical sense. Hegel's insistence on finding meaning in history, nature and the world is, according to Nietzsche, the psychologist, the main reason why Schopenhauer hated Hegel so much. His hostility to Hegel had here its motive. The non-divinity of existence was regarded by him as something understood, palpable, indisputable. He always lost his philosophical composure and got into a passion when he saw anyone hesitate and beat around the bush here. So Nietzsche blames Hegel for postponing the asking of the Schopenhauerian question on the significance of existence. Where does that leave us? Well, Schopenhauer did eventually arrive, and he did eventually pose the question. How did things develop from there? Sadly, not too well. As we have reiterated throughout this video, the question, once posed, brings with it a host of implications that will take time to sink in. Nietzsche dedicates a few words to Schopenhauer's reception in Germany, and he is not positive about it. He mentions by name three philosophers. Julius Bahnsen, Eduard von Hartmann, Philipp Meinländer. These three were followers of Schopenhauer's philosophy. They critically engaged with it and let him influence their own philosophies. In this sense, they are post-Schopenhauerian philosophers. But neither of these three, says Nietzsche, truly engaged with the most important question that Schopenhauer asked. They are not real pessimists. One could, on the contrary, lay great stress on the peculiar awkwardness of this post-Schopenhauerian pessimism. Germans evidently do not behave themselves here as in their element. No. The Germans of today are not pessimists. And Schopenhauer was a pessimist, I repeat it once more, as a good European and not as a German. Rather than one of these three aforementioned philosophers, Bansen, Hartmann or Meinländer, Nietzsche saw himself as a true heir of the Schopenhauerian tradition, even if that meant running counter to his entire philosophy. That might sound paradoxical, but in the context of this question, what is the significance of existence, Nietzsche saw himself as the only one truly able to tackle it and engage with it. He disagreed vehemently with Schopenhauer's answer to the question, but he considered Schopenhauer a genius nonetheless for raising it. Now, a few words on Meinländer. In contrast to Hartmann and Bansen, which are relatively obscure nowadays, the name Meinländer pops up now and again in the comments on this channel, indicating some interest in his work. We will do a dedicated video or even a video series on his main work, The Philosophy of Redemption, which is not translated into English yet. The relationship between Nietzsche and Meinländer is quite complex and has an interesting history behind it, which we will also explore here on the channel. So please subscribe if you don't want to miss this. Let's fast forward to today. It's been over 200 years since Schopenhauer first unleashed his philosophy upon the world, and it's been over 100 years since Nietzsche died. Where are we now in regards to the fundamental question, what is the significance of existence? Well, we haven't conclusively answered the question yet. And probably we never will. But the question has become more urgent than ever. In a way, this question spawned the entirety of existentialist philosophy, which dominated the latter half of the 20th century. Kierkegaard, the philosopher who is commonly credited with being the first truly existential philosopher, tried to escape Hegel's all-encompassing system of the development of history, looking at Hegel's huge construction, his grand historical narrative of one concept evolving out of the next, the great march of the Geist through history, Kierkegaard asked himself, what about me? What about the individual? How do I fit in this grand Hegelian system? And while Kierkegaard stood firmly in the Christian tradition and tried to reconcile these questions with the Christian framework, Subsequent existentialist philosophers took its development one step further and tried to answer the question without the help of God. Then we arrive at names like Camus, Sartre, Heidegger, de Beauvoir, Jaspers. The question still occupies us today, and it has become a sort of cliché. We don't really speak of the significance of existence anymore, but we've all heard the modern formulation. 
what is the meaning of life? With the death of God, this question came to the forefront of our collective consciousness. It was Schopenhauer who, as the first avowed philosophical atheist, raised the question. It was Nietzsche who pointed it out to the world, and it was the long line of philosophers after them who tried to answer it. Nietzsche predicted that this question would occupy us for another few centuries. And today, 200 years after Schopenhauer, and more than 100 years after Nietzsche, he still stands correct. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video and you want more, please like and subscribe. And leave a comment for the algorithm, it helps out the channel a great deal. If you want to support the work we do here on the channel even more, you can join us on Patreon. A special thank you goes out to the existing patrons who keep the channel running. Their support is invaluable. As a bonus, patrons in the higher tiers have access to a monthly exclusive video. And thanks again to our supporters. If you want more Nietzsche, our video on the joyful science would be the logical next step as it deals with the death of God in more detail. We've also done a video on Nietzsche's warning to scientists, which deals with one of the unexpected consequences of the death of God as it concerns questions of science. Again, thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next one.